Hi there, this is Jesse Bidell, and I will be discussing my paper, Braided Streams, Intertwining Soundscape, Strata and Ecological Data in South Australia's Limestone Coast. So, to begin, uh, in acoustic ecology and ecoacoustics, live streaming of soundscapes has in recent years become an increasingly popular means of monitoring ecosystem activity and behaviour, as well as a source of material for creative projects. Perhaps most notable amongst these efforts is the Locus Sonus Sound Map, which is a global open microphone network hosting soundscape streams around the world. Uh, and also there are some notable individual projects such as the Whale Song Project, Orca Live Project and Live Antarctic Ocean Streaming Audio uh, Stream by the Alfred Wegner Institute. When considering the creative approaches um, in using uh, live streams. There's multiple possibilities offered um, as well as limitations uh, with sound stream content and context. Uh, as the Locus Sonos website notes, using audio live streams implies questioning traditional listening and compositional practices where audio content is predetermined. It raises questions regarding real time and real space, as well as continuity and mobility that are reflected overall in the corpus of artistic creations. Some of the considerations of creative projects include whether to use an individual stream or perhaps multiple streams, um, with the projection of specific sonic environments versus the combination of a variety of soundscapes, each bringing its own context to the table. There's also the question of diffusion. Are the microphone setup and reproduction systems correlated, i.e. are there matched stereo or ambisonic inputs and outputs um, or whatever other variety? Um, or are these independent? Are they not necessarily matched um, such that the image of the microphone capture is then output through a similar complementary system? And lastly, in terms of processing, what considerations do the ephemerality and imminence of the live stream require uh, in terms of the processing treatment and also what is contextually appropriate? Some examples of creative projects uh, include, as related to individual streams, the Marconi Radio in Second Life project by Brett Balog, which streams soundscapes into uh, Second Life virtual spaces. The Locust Stream Promenade, which is a project uh, using parabolic speakers to project live streams from above, uh, making a hyper-specific localised listening experience. Then considering multiple streams, you've got the Blank Memory and Live Acousma by Eric M. project, which utilises live streams in a multi-channel array alongside live improvisation. You've got the Split Soundscape by Grégoire Levin, uh, a reconstruction of a city soundscape through multiple live streams in a multi-channel array, and also Reve, which is a project by SoundCamp, uh, Reve being an annual 24-hour broadcast of dawn choruses around the globe on International Dawn Chorus Day. In considering some areas less explored, when multiple streams are used, these are typically from geographically and ecologically disconnected locations. And what we get often is the juxtaposition of specific acoustic environments and associated contexts, and also uh, a kind of assumed horizontal plane, both between source and reproduction, um, perhaps due to standards of commercial surround sound and multi-channel systems, uh, with verticality being addressed in ambisonic and binaural systems although this could be argued to be changing more recently. So this brings me to my project, Strata, uh, developed last year and continuing into this year. The idea behind this work was that it was an exploration of multiple streams at the same location, uh, each providing contrasting soundscape perspectives at different vertical levels, and this would be coupled with the complementary reproduction system. As part of a Country Arts SA artist residency at the Sir Robert Heltman Theatre in Mount Gambier, South Australia, the proposed project was to develop a live stream installation comprising three microphones arranged vertically at multiple levels of a limestone coast site with a counterpart speaker array in the theatre's courtyard. The particular location I was privileged to set up the microphones was the Narracourt Caves National Park, and the stream boxes there were situated at subterranean ground and tree canopy levels. 
the boxes consisting of a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with LocustStream uh, Operating System 4 installed, a Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 of second generation, for the Surface level kits, a Rode M5 condenser mic, which was mono signal, covered with dead kittens to protect them from the weather, and for the subterranean kits, an XLR split from the Narracourt Cave Management's pre-existing audiovisual infrastructure, this being an infrared video coupled with a microphone for back colony monitoring. There was also an Ethernet internet connection to an external mobile router, which each of the three stream boxes connects to. In terms of reproduction, these live streams are first sent to Locusonus and then are streamed to the counterpart vertical speaker array in the Sir Robert Helpman Theatre Courtyard. The equipment here included three tiers of Crix Aquatics stereo speakers set up on the ground, mezzanine and roof levels of the Theatre Courtyard, a Rodal RMB 15066 channel distribution app, a Focusrite Scarlet 18i20 audio interface and an iMac 2012 running a standalone app for the installation developed in Max 8. Looking particularly at the software here, uh, I used first of all three instances of VLC player for streaming, with each of these sending an output to a composite six channel virtual device developed in loop back. This virtual device is then processed and routed to inputs in a standalone app developed in Max 8, the Strata app, as you can see in the images on the right. And there's further processing that occurs inside the app, which utilizes Bureau of Meteorology or BOM data from the Narracourt station to control various audio effects. Some of these have direct correlation, so correlation between the data and the particular effect. Uh, for example, temperature and humidity are mapped to control the air VST, third party VST uh, from sound particles, which simulates the sound filtering and attenuation based on air conditions. Uh, some are arbitrary, um, for example, wind direction and speed affect the mix between the soundscape strata and air pressure controls reverberation. The result of this is a dynamic layered installation manipulated or sculpted by localised environmental conditions. When considering the outcomes of this installation, uh, if we consider soundscapes to be an acoustic outcome of ecological activity, indicated through the biophony, geophony, and anthropophony, biophony being the sounds of living organisms, geophony the sounds of abiotic earth-based processes such as weather and rain, and anthropophony being the sounds of human-based activity, particularly transportation and infrastructure. Then the juxtaposition of soundscape strata that are geologically separate allows for the apprehension of ecological relationships not otherwise noticeable, especially as related to subterranean and terrestrial activity. Considering the outcomes as it relates to processing, um, there are particular observations we can make about the live streams that might our, inform our approach here. First, live stream soundscapes, as mentioned before, are imminent and ephemeral, typically with cyclical behaviours or attributes, and this is in contrast to predetermined content where we can predict the specific details encompasses a broad frequency range, typically 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And environmental contexts are significant with the soundscape material itself conveying implicit ecological relationships between the biophony, geophony, and anthropophony. Within these considerations, processing is subtle, so as not to obscure the ecological relationships evoked through the soundscape structural relationships, and could be akin to uh, sculpting or perhaps reinforcing particular attributes. For example, the application of filtering and attenuation provides particular boundaries on the soundscape. Reverberation temporarily extends particular soundscape activities and is assisted by the resonant frequencies of the courtyard space. And changes in mix provide contrasting oral perspectives between the various strata. We also get a development of an ecosystem of practice um, in that both human and non-human collaboration are involved in the realization of the work. Um, for example, the compositional decisions uh, related to network infrastructure, both hardware and software, and the spatio-temporal position of these uh, various uh, pieces of equipment have an effect on the outcomes, as does the sonic activity of 
non-human biotic and abiotic agents as conveyed through the biophony, geophony and anthropophony. And similarly, the processes involved in the streaming of sound, those being the transductive changes between acoustic energy to electromagnetic and digital representation and vice versa, each have a contribution in the final uh, outcome of the work. There's a resonance here with the ideas of Timothy Morton's Dark Ecology Project in that there's an embracement of the interdependence between human and non-human entities, particularly as it relates to um, the positioning of this equipment in natural and built spaces. And also Karen Barrard's Agential Realism, where her ideas of phenomena and apparatus are entangled and these interactively leave traces upon one another through agential cuts. There's also the acoustic transformation of the reproduction space. The theatre courtyard is the nexus of uh, Mount Gambier's Civic Centre, um, with abutting council offices and chambers to the theatre. And the building itself uh, features a distinctive brutalist architecture with many hard surfaces that makes for a highly reflective space. The installation, as a result, provides an immersive experience from various positions in the space, both at ground level and at mezzanine level. Uh, as Linda Murray Walker's catalogue essay on the work explains, this soundscape strata has a life of its own, as does the composer and listener. Sound has travelled through the atmosphere across the world, from Narracourt to France to Mount Gambia. We are here if we wish... Uh, we are here to hear, if we wish, an artwork as it crisscrosses of foyer's space-time, mixing with whatever other sound or noise is present at any moment and momentarily. This soundscape strata has a life of its own, as does the composer and listener. Sound has travelled through the atmosphere across the world, from Narracourt to France to Mount Gambia. We are here to hear, if we wish, an artwork as it crisscrosses a foyer's space or time, mixing with whatever other sound or noise is present at any moment, and momentarily, one can sense the affects of time, both immediate and infinitely distant, as the event of sound itself. In terms of considering future directions, uh, one particular area that I'd like to extend the work is the recording of these live streams for ecoacoustics analyses. This would involve the use of acoustic indices to evaluate the ecological activity between the various soundscape strata at different temporal and spatial scales. And what, what this would permit is the comparison of environmental conditions and soundscape activity between subterranean and terrestrial strata, particularly where subterranean conditions remain relatively stable. It would be interesting to see if there are effects from the changes in weather above ground. Also, uh, there's a prospect that this analysis could aid in the conservation efforts of the critically endangered southern bentwing bats, which are endemic to this particular cave system. Um, and uh, as established through bioacoustics research, uh, monitoring of particular populations chorusing can give an indication about the health of these species. Additionally, the implementation of similar live stream systems in locations with vertical stratification or variations in elevation um, would be good, as we've previously um, seen achieved in the Nature Conservancy and Rainforest Listening projects with pre-recorded material. And these particular projects have the capacity for increasing understanding and awareness around the stratification of acoustic environments, both as related to ecological research and aesthetic appreciation. I'd like to thank Country Arts SA, SA Power Networks, the Government of SA, Mount Gambia Council, the Australia Council for the Arts, Narracourt Caves, and the Telstra Store of Mount Gambia for their support of this project. Thank you very much. Hey, ACMC 2020. My name is James Curtis. Uh, most people call me Jay. I'm from RMIT University in Melbourne. I'm here to talk about AbleSuite, which is some software I've been developing. 
So the title of my paper is Able Tweet, Harnessing Social Media APIs for Encoding, Co-Creating, and Performing Improvised Generative Electronic Music. And my background is that I'm an electronic musician. I've been producing music as Listexic for a number of years, and my focus is more towards sound design and experimentation. I'm currently undertaking PhD in RMIT School of Design, uh, and I'm focusing on AI and machine learning uh, with sound design. I'm also a creative coder, and I use a whole range of different frameworks. And one of those um, being JavaScript, I was quite interested in the new feature in Max 8, which allows you to uh, use node.js. Um, so I was quite interested in using Node to talk to the Twitter API uh, inside a Max for Live device. So I could talk to the Max for Live API as well as the Twitter API and use uh, tweet data as the sole basis to generate music. Uh, so that was the focus of a performance that I did uh, at that time, and I've been developing the system uh, since then. And it's quite an interesting system to, to work with. So essentially what Ableton does is it serves you, uh, spawns a whole bunch of MIDI clips based on your tweet searches. So here's a little video of when I was developing um, the Able Tweet device. You can see that each individual clip corresponds to a tweet from a search. Uh, and it's a novel way to, to work with um, pattern data. And what's quite interesting about the system is that when you're not creating any of the pattern data yourself, it's being generated from the system. It allows you to focus on the things that I particularly like about uh, music generation, and that's uh, sound design and, and macro structure. So finding um, how these patterns fit together and, and performing them. It's quite interesting uh, in an improvisational setting where you kind of have to navigate your way through these uh, strange and um, often unmusical patterns and then try to develop um, something cohesive out of that. It's quite an interesting challenge uh, with focus to polyrhythmic stuff, which is something else I'm into. So I want to talk about the actual method that I use to develop these patterns. Um, it's relatively simple. Essentially, uh, the way that I approached it was that I wanted to preserve some of the, the structural elements of the tweet text data um, while even though I'm abstracting away from the semantic content of each tweet, I wanted to preserve some of the, the rhythmic or cadence to it. Um, so the way that I did that was that for each letter in each word uh, that corresponds to a fixed note resolution that the, it's parameterized so the user can pick it. So in the case of 16th notes, a six letter word would be six sixteenths. Uh, and you can see that in this pattern here. So the word making is six sixteenths long and music is five keeping is seven, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's how the note lengths are derived. And the pitch, um, I explored a few different ways to, to generate um, pitch from these tweets. And ultimately, uh, I decided to reduce the, the text data to Unicode. Uh, the reason that I looked into Unicode was that it allows uh, all the different, many different character sets of all different languages plus emojis. So it's a quite simple quantization algorithm. Um, I'm just summing the letters together and then uh, in their Unicode values and then moduloing them to arrive uh, at, at an octave. The first one sets the root, the tonic, and then um, using scalar arrays to, to look through for something that will fit into that particular chosen scale, in this case, a whole tone scale. And I was quite interested in trying to develop this uh, around some some semantic content within the tweets. Um, how, how could I explore the pattern generation being related to the semantic content? So an obvious choice is sentiment analysis, which is really common to perform on, on Twitter, Twitter data. 
Uh, so I used a node package called Sentiment, which uh, has the AFIN 165. It's a 4,000 word list that uh, numbers valence values between negative 5 and plus 5 are given, whether the word's a positive or a negative word. And it also has uh, emoji sentiment rankings, which is really useful uh, for Twitter data. So, you know, in this example, I love cats, but I'm allergic to them. Love is plus 3. Uh, allergic is negative 2. So we arrive at a sentiment score of 1. But I was really interested in perhaps using uh, these these monophonic sequences and how I could um, begin to kind of accent them with some some harmony. So I chose to apply just a simple, just uh, embellishing these particular words in the index um, uh, with with chords, with simple triads. So for uh, obvious choice again, being major chords for positive values, uh, positive valence, and, and minor chords for negative. And I wanted to take this a bit further because within each valence, there's five levels, five scores. So I needed to be able to differentiate, say, in this case, good from like. Good is scored plus three, like is scored plus two. So in this case, I augment a major triad uh, and to, to brighten it up and do the reverse with minus so move to diminish and this kind of brightness uh darkness kind of way of articulating the the uh, sentiment analysis values uh was an interesting way to approach it and i've been interested in trying to take that a bit further um uh, been looking at uh, modal changes and discovered this uh this system that um, Adam Neely calls the um, Dorian brightness quotient, um, kind of jokingly. Uh, and so there's some great tables on Arthur Fox's website, Arthur Fox Music, uh, where he applies these to um, all the different scales. And it's something I'm quite interested to implement. So there's another aspect to this project, which is the co-creation and bidirectionality um, functions, which uh, were intended to be able to use the Twitter API to um, send send clips out to the world and also retrieve them. Um, it's a novel implementation of of a networking protocol, uh, and it, it's functional. Uh, it's quite interesting too. I developed this text encoding system, uh, which is just taking uh, the data from MIDI clips and then encoding them into Unicode. So Unicode's again useful in this context uh, because each Unicode um, a character can represent an integer, a, a much larger integer. Uh, you, can in, you can reverse encode them. So you can use um, a you know, a strange character like this to represent a, a different number and, and take up one character in that 140 character space and still have some room for hashtags. So the way that I sort of see this going is that there's some novel kind of experiments that could be conducted with uh, remote collaboration. So sending sending clips to one another uh, in, this, in this fashion uh, and also in, engaging groups. So what if a whole bunch of people were working on something at, at one time, perhaps on a live stream and developing a whole bunch of different songs from the same material and sharing material um, across uh, across Twitter in this way. And a, a big part of what I, f I like about this is um, I like the, aest the aesthetic, um, uh, the aesthetics of it, um, but I also enjoy the um, clogging up Twitter's arteries with this junk data. Um, I, I find that personally satisfying. Uh, and when I was performing with this system, I found it really interesting that um, there's, there's aspects of this for crowd engagement um, that are a little bit novel. Uh, when I was soliciting tweets from people to encode uh, in situ in the middle of a performance, um, people were yelling out, play my tweet. Uh, it's a very different way to to engage with a crowd uh and this this way to engage with um participants also extends to before an event so you can um develop event specific hashtags that you could encode into the performance and that's what i've done for my performance at acmc and another um 
relatively interesting uh, aspect to this is that um, you can actually live code inside um, Ableton Live. Uh, you can live code JavaScript uh, because the script is only being run when the clips are generated. Um, you can adjust the scripts and write new functions um, and, and adjust the quantization arrays or, or add in your own while this is happening, um, which is an aspect to Ableton that I hadn't considered. So for some future work, I would like to extend the phrasing and harmonic parameterization in the ways that I described before and with um, with reference to the harmonic parameterization, I think it'd be quite interesting uh, to develop that, that further using sentiment analysis uh, and also extend some phrasing possibilities. Uh, probably look at um, machine learning, you know, long short-term memory models and recurrent neural networks and tensorflow.js. Uh, and there's there's a quite a big interesting thing that could be developed with uh, media content flags. Uh, if there's some media content that's attached to the tweet, uh, that could be directly imported into Ableton, and perhaps uh, you could VJ some clips sourced directly from Twitter in the same method uh, that you could improvise with um, these generated MIDI patterns. And ultimately, uh, open source is a big. Um, uh, a big target. I want to get this um, into the open source community so they can um, shed their own ideas on this this project. And just to wrap up, the purpose of this project for me is less um, less around this idea of the ultimate text to MIDI algorithm, and it's more about this idea of social media APIs in general and our relation to them as artists that we have. Um, I think social media APIs are a unique. Uh, a new a unique space to work in because they're both a medium um, and they're also a public forum or public space. Um, and so this idea of uh, graffiti and vandalism comes to mind when working creatively in, in public spaces with, um, with experimental works. Uh, I think that if you were to consider graffiti as a model, uh, style and skill are developed in the open using public spaces as the studio. And so this is kind of my assertion to the conference is that um, I highly encourage uh, artists out there to to use social media um, in this way. It's a it's our public space to use. So I, I encourage you to work as visibly and experimentally as possible with uh, API access uh, and not necessarily in the pursuit of utility, but um, in the pursuit of novelty. It's totally uh, interesting spaces to work in. So if you are interested in getting involved in the AbleSuite project, uh, it is open source and it will be available on GitHub. Um, if you just want to navigate to abletweet.net, that's the easiest place to find information around the project. So thanks for your time. Uh, and thanks to Charles, Alex, and everyone else from the conference. Um, it's a real pleasure to have contributed. Thank you.